So I'll, uh, I'll be talking about an ongoing project um, in, in, in our institute, which is focused on ensuring that the data flows that exist in a large-scale data retrieval system are in fact complying with the applicable policies. And this is joint work with uh, my students, uh, Eslam, Asta, and Anjo, who do all of the work, and with my colleague, Deepa Garg, who provides all of the expertise in uh, policy languages and security. So, and I should mention that this, is, this talk and this work is very much in the work in progress category. So, what do I mean when I talk about data retrieval systems? So, a data retrieval system um, sort of, in fact, um, is, you know, defines a large class of web services that offer services such as publishing and blogging information and trading and sharing goods of information, goods and information. There's typically also a social networking component. Uh, um, users have access to functionality that allows them to browse the, um, you know, the graph of items or the graph of people participating in the system, and they can search based on uh, textual keywords. And there's often also a recommendation com component to such a system that essentially su suggests to users um, both people and data items and information items that they might be interested in. And finally, there's often an advertising component which helps, in fact, fund the service, right, if it's otherwise free to users. Um, now, these kinds of systems have typically maintain a, a large variety of different information, right, ranging from documents, worldwide web pages, microblogs, posts, uh, news stickers, and like I said, the online social network. And the way users interact typically with these kinds of systems, and this is important, is that they click on things, right, to navigate the graph of people and, and data items. Um, they can post information, um, and they can uh, issue textual queries to search for specific items. And the way the system responds to them is typically by providing a, a form of mashup of the original input source data to the system. And this is important, right? Um, in a data retrieval system, uh, there may be complex computations going on to try to model users' interests, to try to index information, but that, the results of that computation are primarily used to select certain source data items to show to the user and then assemble them in a mashup and hand them to the user. Right? That's what I mean by a data retrieval system. And, of course, as you can see, this uh, definition, of course, suits uh, you know, big providers like Google and Facebook and, uh, and eBay, but also a plethora of uh, smaller scale uh, systems such as uh, enterprise websites and information systems, so-called vertical search engines that are focused on a particular community or a particular topic. Um, so there are many, many sites that, that fit this uh, classification. Okay? Now, what characterizes them in a way is that there are many data types and even more data items. Uh, there are many different policies uh, that apply, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, which essentially say who has access to a particular item, for what purpose, and for how long. And there's typically a very complex and dynamic code base that's constantly under development, and the result often is that you have mishaps uh, that are then often widely publicized, uh, essentially uh, reporting that you know, some information was released to certain parties that should not have actually had access. Okay? And um, you, you have seen all those. And these kinds of reports, of course, are embarrassing to the, to the provider of the site. Uh, if uh, legal requirements were violated, they may also come with a fee. Um, and more generally, I think they serve to undermine the public's confidence in information technology. So they're a serious problem uh, to consider. So let's look at these data retrieval systems in a, in a slightly more detail. Um, so if you look inside them, there is typically an underlying database th uh, that has a row for users containing things like the browser cookie, authentication credentials, uh, settings, privacy settings and preferences, um, you know, the friends, their friends in the social network, um, some uh, prefix of the search and query and click history of a particular user, and then some profile, which is often a statistical uh, model um, of uh, the user's inferred preferences uh, and, uh, and interests. Okay? Um, there is an indexer that indexes all the information available to, to the system and produces a joint index, which is then used by the search engine to answer textual search queries. Um, there is a back-end analytics engine that periodically fires up and does things like read the prefix of the user's history and produce or update the statistical model of that user's uh, preferences. 
Um, there is an ad exchange that you know, suggests uh, advertisements to show the user based on their inferred preferences and interests. And there is a recommendation engine that suggests, again, people and data items to the user. And finally, there's a front end uh, that actually provides the HTML interface. Okay? So as you can see, there's a lot going on here. Um, and in practice, it's actually far more complicated than this because you have distribution, you have parallel processing. So for instance, the indexer and the analytics in the engine would typically actually take the form of a large MapReduce job. Um, you know, the search engine itself is probably widely parallelized and distributed if it's a large scale system and so on. And finally, even the data that the system maintains, such as the online social network, is actually uh, often stored in multiple representations that are each optimized for different types of accesses. Right? So it's a really complicated system with a non-trivial data flow. Now let's look what happens if we add policies into the mix. Okay? So there are certain information items here that are public. Right? The news ticker perhaps is always public. Some posts are public. Um, the ads are public, the microblogs, and many of the World Wide Web pages that are being indexed are public, but not necessarily all of them. Um, there are certain information that are private to a particular owner or subject of the data, documents, um, emails, um, and some of the columns in the user database are typically private. There's some information that is available also to friends, um, certain posts. Okay? And others are available to friends of friends, so the, the two-hop neighborhood in the social graph. So these are the kinds of uh, policies that you typically see that are derived from a user's privacy choices and settings. But there are also policies that come from data sources. For instance, a news ticker source up here right, might stipulate that news ticker items must only be shown for two hours and then expire. Um, the, the, the service provider may, or typically has their own privacy policy which might say things like, you know, your, um, your search history is only used for personalization and the history itself is deleted after 48 hours, right? It might say that in the privacy policy that you, uh, that you get and many other related uh, items. Uh, a typical uh, other provider policy is that if a staff member uh, accesses client data, it's subject to auditing. This is just a way of making sure that, you know, people have a legitimate reason if and when they access client's data. Um, and then finally, there are legislative um, uh, contexts, right? And so, for instance, uh, certain content items might be banned in certain jurisdictions. So the EU, as you know, has um, uh, recently uh, introduced this, uh, this right to be forgotten, where under certain conditions you can go and say, I want this piece of information about me to be removed in the sense that it no longer shows up in search engines search result. And there have also already been you know, tens of thousands of such requests that search engine providers now have to uh, honor. And finally, there are general legal requirements, for instance, about logging and retention of certain types of information, right? uh, health records, emails, uh, you have it. So the challenge here is that you have many different data items and uh, uh, almost as many policies, okay? because um, policies are not typically attached to data types, but to individual data items. Um, and to make things worse, the policy is often implicit in the system configuration, in various access control lists, and in enforcement logic. And that enforcement logic often itself is spread over many different components and layers of the system. Right? So figuring out what policy is actually in place for a given data item is a non-trivial task, and so is actually ensuring compliance with all those policies. And this whole thing is, is made even worse by the fact that uh, quite often your application code base is very large and uh, under constant development, right? It's a very agile piece of software. So what we have been trying to do about this is to design a system called Thought, which um, essentially provides a distributed data compliance layer. So it's a runtime enforcement approach that tries not to interfere with the system as, and, you know, to the extent possible, but tries to make sure that any data flow in the system is in fact subject to well-defined policies. So in the following, I'll give you a brief overview, talk about the threat model, we'll talk a little bit about the policy language, about the enforcement, and some techniques we're using uh, to solve particular problems. And I'll show you, um, you know, some preliminary evaluation based on a prototype, and then I'll conclude. So what is thought? Um, so one key component of it is a declarative policy language uh, that uh, concisely allows uh, policy designers, these are typical you know, people, people like privacy officers in a, in a large corporation, to state uh, 
the confidentiality, integrity, constraints uh, of a data item, and also the provenance and declassification uh, rules, which you can think of as predicates over a data flow. Okay, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. These policies are then attached to data conduits. A data conduit is something like a file, a tuple in a key value store, a pipe or a network connection, anything that can hold data or convey data right, at the level of the, 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 the operating system. And finally, there is a distributed enforcement layer that mediates process I.O. at the operating system level. Okay? So we're not looking inside processes, we're just observing input and output from a given process. And um, we use that information to essentially track the flow of information at process granularity through a distributed system. Okay? And finally, this layer interprets and enforces the policies on the conduits that are visible to it. So what are the challenges? At a very high level, obviously, since this is a runtime approach, we're going to have to shoot for low runtime overhead, right? Some of the information flow control uh, approaches that, you've, uh, that you're familiar with don't necessarily um, have that property. We need to, the, to the extent possible, work with existing software, right? It would be unrealistic to assume that a large provider or that the massive amounts that, of components and software that are available to build systems like that would all have to change, right, to accommodate this type of system. We want this to be easy to use, right? We cannot expect application developers to spend a lot of extra effort to deal with the system. And we wanted to rely on a relatively small and stable trusted computing base, because otherwise, you know, if the system that we're depending on is as large as the original system, there's no reason to believe that there wouldn't be as many bugs in that system as in the overall system. So what are some of the key ideas, just at a high level, right? Um, I already touched on this. We're doing information flow control at the process level. This has a couple of advantages. We're language and runtime independent. We don't have to mess with all the plethora of existing uh, languages that exist, runtime systems and frameworks, right? They can stay as they are. Um, and it's actually a fairly good match for the kind of distributed and parallel processing frameworks that are typically used today in data center systems of this nature, right? So um, you typically have um, processes that are fired up for a particular purpose. Um, they consume some data, they produce some results, and then they shut down. This is a good match for this kind of model. Although it's not universal, because as we'll see, we'll, we will have long-running processes in the system that we have to deal with. Another um, uh, unusual thing here, and in fact a novel thing, is that uh, declassification and provenance is actually stated as part of the policy language and enforced by the enforcement system. Okay? Whereas in uh, typical information flow control systems, what you do is that you have so-called trusted declassifiers. These are just ordinary application programs that happen to be trusted, and they look at some data and say, this looks okay, let's declassify it. Okay? And this wanna, we want to avoid to the extent possible because it sort of undermines the nice model of not trusting applications and just enforcing what is written in the policy. Um, and finally, what we do is, unlike in conventional information flow control, where if you're familiar with it, um, if you're not, it doesn't matter, typically a policy is actually encoded in a set of labels and rules for how to combine these labels and what operations are allowed on an object with a particular set of labels, right? So what you propagate in the system along a data flow are these labels. What we do instead is we actually propagate policies. So a process gets tainted with the policies of all the data that it has consumed. Okay? And this has the advantage that we can actually do um, something like partial evaluation of policies along a data flow, and that turns out to be critical for dealing with taint. We have simple transactions, um, which allow an application process to perform a set of read and write operations on, on, an, on a set of objects. And then the policy is evaluated once on the entire transaction, and it commits if, in fact, the policy says, yes, this is compliant, it aborts otherwise, right? This turns out to, uh, first of all, allow us to have complex policies that, in order to satisfy them, you actually have to do more than one read and write. And secondly, we actually can reduce the overhead of uh, policy evaluation as all, because we're doing policy evaluation once per transaction instead of once per read or write. We have user authentication built into the enforcement logic. So we don't have to rely on untrusted user processes to authenticate users and tell us this is Bob. Okay? We do it ourselves. 
and therefore we can directly enforce policies that refer to the identity of a principle. And finally, we, have a, we can take a general, general approach where um, the policies only say what needs to be true about an access. And how you demonstrate compliance is actually left to untrusted code. And that uh, turns out to be an important um, approach because it allows us to keep the policies very concise and therefore also the policy uh, language and its interpretation very simple. And I'll show you examples of all of that uh, down the line. Let me briefly talk about the threat model. <clears throat> We're essentially assuming here that the operating system, the storage it depends on, and of course the thought implementation are trusted. We think this is reasonable in this environment because the operating system kernel is typically much smaller than the system built on top of it. Right? It's also maintained by a, by a much smaller team of experts and it's not under constant daily development. We also ignore certain implicit flows and we ignore side channels. Um, I won't be able to get into more detail, but um, uh, just imagine, for instance, if you see that a process tries to access some data and it's denied, you know that it has somehow you know, failed to satisfy the policy. That in itself is an information leak, which we don't deal with. Um, some declassification policies, right, which are a matter of uh, what the policy designers decides, do assume that applications do not deliberately try to encode private information on things like search results. Um, that's a weakening of the threat model, where you just assume that you know, the applications are not outright malicious. They're just buggy and misconfigured. That's a choice that the policy designer can make, and in, in, I'll show you examples of that. So with that, let me quickly show you a little bit more pictorially how things work in op their operation. This is essentially just showing how an information flow control system works, and with a few edges. So we have a system here, a distributed system. Um, think of a data center. Um, it has multiple nodes and it has this thought enforcement layer um, which you can think of uh, sitting just on top of the operating system, although it actually is integrated into the operating system to, for the most part. It intercepts all I.O. by processes. So if an external user, Bob, connects to one of the processes here, you know, this is maybe the HTML front end process, okay, it uses an authenticated secure connection and to authenticate, of course, Bob on this connection, the process will have to access the uh, authentication credentials of user Bob. And by doing so, it acquires the taint of that cell in the database. Okay? So this uh, yellow scroll here is the policy, and showing it up here means that process P is now tainted with that policy. And that's actually a very useful mechanism because Bob knows once he has successfully authenticated to a process in that system, that process is now tainted with his policy. So it can't do anything that is not okay with Bob. Okay? Um, if um, that process down the line communicates with another process, you know, the taint propagates there. Uh, now that process writes into another cell in the database. What happens here is a little bit interesting. That database cell already had a policy, the black policy. If that black policy actually supersedes the yellow policy, then nothing happens here. The yellow taint is not propagated here because it actually, you know, the policy here is at least as strong or stronger. You know, if another process reads this um, <coughs> cell, it gets tainted with the black policy and so forth. And finally, if our original front end process reads this file here, it gets additionally tainted with the green policy which in this example is not superseded by the yellow policy, so it's actually added to the process's taint. Okay? And whether or not the, pr the process can now ex extricate some information to Bob will depend on whether it can satisfy the, both the yellow and the green policy. Right? This is at a high level uh, how things work. Okay. Good. So now let's look at the policy language. Um, so a policy language in our system essentially has five rules of the form permission dash colon, uh, colon dash condition, right? You may um, notice this looks like data law clauses. In fact, we are in fact using restrict, restricted, a restricted form of data law clauses. So a permission is one of read, update, destroy, provenance, or declassify, okay? Read basically states the condition for reading from that conduit, right? Remember a policy is attached to a conduit. Update must hold when someone modifies that conduit. conduit. Destroy must hold for someone to destroy it, which actually means freeing up its name. Okay? And then provenance and declassify are special rules that essentially place um, uh, uh, constraints on the data flow, and we'll talk about it later. 
A condition which appears on the right side of this clause is a Boolean expression of predicates, and there are a number of predicates that deal with you know, relational um, arithmetic uh, operations that provide access to sessions, you know, authenticated sessions to a user, to conduits, um, to content, right? So we can actually ac refer to and access to the content of a particular uh, a conduit, um, as well its existing content and its uh, update content that is being proposed in a transaction, and also to certificates that represent uh, information from external trusted sources, such as a trusted wall clock time, right? So we can refer to wall clock time. Now, declassification has an additional rule of the form C1 until C2, and essentially what this means is that um, uh, on any downstream conduit from which, into which data from this conduit flows, okay, C1 must hold, and C1 is a constraint on the policy of that downstream conduit, until we hit a conduit that, uh, for which C2 holds. So we actually have, um, you know, we can have stateful declassification policies, um, which turns out to be uh, very powerful because you can say things like, you know, for this to be declassified, it has to be approved by this and then by this entity. We have also prominence rules, which allow you to do the same thing in the upstream direction. So you're saying data that flows into this conduit must have been subject to C1 until uh, it flo flowed into a conduit for which C2 held. Okay? Again, I'm going to provide uh, examples of this later. Um, I'm not e expecting you to read this. This is just to show you that uh, the language is not large. Right? This is, in fact, the full set of predicates. So there are about 35 or so. So let's look at some example policies. Um, um, so client access control. This is sort of the simplest thing, right? A client um, um, co contributes a post or a document and wants to state um, what, who can access this. How do we represent this internally? Um, so we essentially say if the thing is private, so this is private, uh, Alice is private information, we just say read uh, requires that um, this predicate holds, which says that the current authenticated connection is authenticated with the public key of Alice. Okay, that's all. If Alice also wants to make this available to her friend, she writes this clause in addition, which says, um, you know, the current uh, connection is authenticated with Bob, um, and Bob is on Alice's friend list. This is just an, a predicate that allows access to, in this case, a tuple in the key value store. Notice here we are specifying an offset. Okay? So it turns out this is an unbound variable in the policy. And it is the untrusted code at the time when it tries to do the access that is expected to provide a binding for that variable. Okay? So we're, allowing, we're expecting the untrusted application to show us where in the access control list it says that Bob is a friend of Alice. Okay? And this is quite flexible because it allows um, the untrusted code to decide how it indexes and searches in an access control list, and we only verify that, in fact, the item is there. And this is sort of an extension that allows you to do friends of friends, right? I'm not going to go through this, but it's, you, it's just to show you uh, it's not uh, uh, difficult to represent these kinds of policies. Uh, update is restricted to Alice, which means you know, only, only Alice can actually change this content, and she can only, uh, she's the only one who can destroy it. So in plain English, this basically says that only authorized users, you know, users authorized by Alice can access this data. Let me show you a second example of a completely different uh, policy that is typically written by the, by the provider right, to uh, fulfill some legal, obliga uh, legal obligation that certain content is censored in certain countries. So for that, there is a declassify, uh, declassification policy actually on all content, okay, which has this unt until clause. And um, bear with me, I'll explain later what the full policy is when we understand more of the system. And we have the sensor macro here, which expands to this. And essentially what this says is we are part of a, an authenticated session which has a source IP address of IP. That IP address is in a given region, so we're looking up a prefix table. And then there is a blacklist associated with that um, region, okay, with each uh, IP prefix, country or region. Uh, and that, blank, that uh, uh, blacklist is expected to be in sorted order. And so, again, we're, um, we're expecting untrusted code to show us an offset. And we say, you know, this, at this offset, there is a particular content ID or conduit ID being mentioned, so something that is being blacklisted. And then one offset later, there is another conduit ID of some, also something that is being um, blacklisted. 
And our, you know, our document, the present document's uh, ID, is in fact larger than conduit one and smaller than conduit two, which effectively means, since this is a sorted list, right, this particular document does not exist in the blacklist. And that's what we want to check, uh, and that satisfies this policy. So in plain English, again, this says data derived from foo.html, which is the so, you know, proposed uh, uh, document that this policy is attached to, must not be accessed by clients with an IP prefix whose blacklist mentions the name of that file. Okay, so there is an, a whole range of other policies we can actually implement uh, in this system. Um, I'll just go over quickly. One is mandatory access logging. So this is the idea that when staff accesses client data, this must be logged. Right? We can write this actually in a few lines of policy by saying uh, declassification to a staff member must come with a log entry in another separate log file. And that separate log file has an integrity policy that allows appends only, meaning you know, once we've accessed, once we've vetted that yes, there is the appropriate log entry and we can allow the access to the staff member, there's no way to remove that log entry. Private history just says, you know, the client search history can only be used for profile generation, you know, for personalization purposes, but, um, but is otherwise private. We can also have expiration policies, for instance, that say that a particular microblock must only be shown to users um, for a certain limited period, and then it, it must no longer be shown. Okay, so let, let's move on to enforcement. <clears throat> So this is something I'll go over quickly. I'll just mainly show you that the policy enforcement algorithm is quite simple and straightforward. There are two cases. Uh, both apply when a process P performs some I.O. on a conduit C. Okay? So the first case is if process P is actually a so-called confined process, meaning that all of its input and output is observed by thought. So this is the typical data center process that we can observe. And then there's a check for the read policy, which is essentially just says add that policy to our taint unless it's already superseded by our current taint. And if there is a check, if, if, there is an, if it's a write, right, then there is something that requires us to look at the declassification policies. And again, uh, bear with me, I won't go into, uh, into the details of this uh, for lack of time. If we have a process that's unconfined, meaning it actually is allowed to do external output or input that we cannot observe, then we have to hold them to um, a stricter um, uh, uh, standard. They have to immediately at this point satisfy either the read or the write uh, uh, permissions on the policy. Okay? And one can show, in fact, that this algorithm ensures that the uh, policies, uh, particularly the policies on the so-called ingress and egress conduits, so the conduits used to bring data into the system and to extricate data out of the system, right? These policies cannot be violated under any circumstances. Interestingly, regardless of the policies you attach to internal conduits. Or another way of saying this is that only the egress and ingress policies are actually um, important for safety and the internal policies are only there for lifeness, right? So if you don't get those right, uh, some legitimate data flows may not be allowed. Um, so at this point, uh, let me see uh, about time. I think we're okay. Um, let me show you an example of some of the problems you run into because as you know, with information flow control systems, you always run into trouble. So um, here, uh, the indexer has indexed all this different content you know, that has very different policies. So as a result, it acquires a bunch of taint which is eventually compressed into essentially read false, which means this, part, this thing you know, cannot be read by anyone. So if you think about it, if this thing just indexes one item of information that's private to me and one item of information that's private to Lorenzo, right? the intersection of that is nobody is allowed to see it. Um, so, and there's no declassification on it either, let's assume here. Right? So effectively, this white taint says you can't do it. You can read and write and compute whatever you want, but you can never extricate any information. Right? So, and as the system, you know, of course that policy gets propagated to the index file and then to the search engine when it reads the index and eventually to the front end when it actually issues a search query and gets the result. So this white policy here, it looks innocent, but it's actually the kiss of death, right? It means you can't do anything. And this is fundamental, right? Because an indexer is essentially an aggregator. If you aggregate over, um, over uh, content with incompatible policies, you can't do anything. So what do we do about this? We're unable to extricate search results, so we have to have some declassification. So in most existing systems, the way you solve this, you simply say the front end is trusted, 
Okay? It then eyeballs the search results. It says, mm, it looks reasonable. Let's just allow it. Okay? Um, so instead, uh, what we actually uh, do is, and I mentioned this before, we have declassification as an explicit condition as part of the policy language. So what you would do to allow um, extrication of search result is to say that each searchable source, source, right? So effectively, any piece of content that you add to the system that you want to be searchable, you add this uh, declassification policy, which essentially says that in, on any downstream conduit, either the read policy on it is as restrictive as my current read policy, this is what this here says, or you reach a conduit that has an update policy that is the conjunction of this thing, which I'll explain in a second, plus sensor, which you already know. Okay, so the sensor will ignore, that's just to make sure that we don't serve content in countries where it's not allowed. And this expands into essentially saying, <clears throat> okay, there is, um, as part of a transaction, some new content being written to this conduit. Well, let's walk through it. Let's suppose that it's a list of conduit IDs. Let's iterate and make sure that each of these conduit IDs is actually an existing object, meaning it's a valid conduit ID, not only in terms of its types, but it refers to an actually existing conduit. So this is uh, what we call a type constraint declassification, right? Um, it doesn't prevent a malicious search engine from trying to you know, encoding my private email in the set of search results. It could do that, um, but it would have to be outright malicious, and it would also be kind of odd because you know, likely in whatever coding you use, uh, the set of search results you get would be rather odd. Okay? It's also sort of a limited bandwidth channel. So what this says in English is allow declassification into a list of valid conduit IDs. And now <clears throat> we can essentially at this point you know, we'll just make sure that this conduit here has the conduit IDs policy, meaning it only allows writing of conduit IDs, and therefore we declassify here when we drop the taint, and the front end now is free to extricate this information it has obtained, namely a list of conduit IDs. Notice, list of conduit IDs does not mean that it can necessarily extricate the content of these references. For that, it still has to satisfy the policies of the individual documents. Okay? Now, so in particular, when the front end then goes and says, oh, okay, the search engine results this particular, you know, um, suggests this particular page, let me get it. It needs to, of course, um, it will acquire the taint from that particular document, um, and that will typically, you know, if it's a public document, have true here, and then have this thing that has end sensor in it, which means it now it needs to still um, satisfy the sensor policy, but it looks like it can do that if Bob is, in fact, or the user is connecting from a region that is not blacklisted for this particular file. However, there is another problem, which is that the front-end process gets um, you know, tainted with the sensor policy. And if we look inside that sensor policy, we see that it actually has something in it um, that is specific to a document, namely the literal file name. Okay? And this is kind of bad because uh, we don't want to taint this front-end process with a particular document that is being read here because the front-end process is a long-running process. It's per session, right? It's supposed to serve that user for a, some period of time. So what we do here is we do something called <clears throat> um, partial policy evaluation. So at this point, right, what the front-end says is it says, assume that the IP variable is bound to this value, right? Trust me, it's from, from the IP address that my user connects, okay? Um, Based on that binding, please partially evaluate the policy. And it turns out, with that binding, you can, in fact, um, uh, you know, evaluate this policy. And all these clauses evaluate to true, except for this one, because this one we cannot verify. We don't know whether the current session is that IP address. So as a, as an, as a, as a result, effectively, the whole clause here gets dropped to just um, session IP is IP. And this is completely generic, right? So this is what the process gets tainted with, tainted with. So notice this, this sort of partial policy evaluation is something that helps us tremendously actually avoid taint accumulation in this long-running pipeline. Um, and it was only possible because we propagated complete policies, not just labels. Okay, so uh, let me try to wrap up. Uh, we have a prototype implementation. Um, it, it consists of a, uh, an LSM module, which is a plugin into the Linux kernel that, uh, you know, for which there is a, a defined interface that intercepts uh, I.O. system calls. It communicates with a trusted reference monitor, which actually does the taint tracking and the policy evaluation and the enforcement. Um, there's also uh, some metadata that Bob maintains and a transaction log. 
and there is a global policy store uh, which you can think of sitting on a shared file system which has all the policies. Um, that's actually the only global component, right? Uh, policy evaluation uh, and enforcement is, is strictly per node otherwise. Um, <clears throat> we built a prototype search engine um, or data retrieval system based on the uh, open source Apache Lucene core um, using a sharded index. So the index is sharded two ways and then each of the search engines is also uh, replicated two ways. So this is just to show that you can scale um, uh, with a memcached database with sort of um, an analytics engine and ad exchange, which we have implemented only to model the data flow because we're not really interested in ad exchanges or analytics, right? We're interested in modeling their data flow. Um, I, I'll go over this again quickly, right? This is a, it's a real implementation running in the cluster uh, on Linux. Um, uh, the, uh, the LSM module for IO interception is three and a half thousand lines of code. The reference monitor is 18,600. Um, and this is running on Lucene 4.7, and we only changed about 15 lines of code in the Lucene search engine, right? This is just to show you that actually the changes to applications are minimal. Um, this is the um, throughput we're currently getting. A couple of things to keep in mind here is we're using a Wikipedia corpus. Um, again, two index char shards of uh, equal, you know, approximately equal size. Everything is in memory, right? These machines have enough memory to have the complete index in memory, which means we're not hiding any overheads. We're not overlapping, you know, policy evaluation with I.O. or using unused cores, right? This is really the raw overhead. And what you see here is if you're using, this is the baseline, right? You see that it scales as you go from one engine per shard to two search engine per shard, it scales nicely. Um, if you enforce all public policies, right? So all policies are in place, but they're all public. Uh, you suffer about a 4.4% overhead right now on the throughput. Um, if you add all the policies I mentioned, right, so mandatory access logging, private search history, um, friends, friends of friends, private content, um, uh, you get another 4.6% overhead for the actual policy interpretation and enforcement. We think there is considerable room for improvement, right? We have not really um, uh, optimized much, particularly the poly policy evaluation, but you see that um, it, it, is, it is not uh, completely unreasonable. Um, again, I think we're running out of time. Let me, um, uh, let me be quick here. The most closely related work is Grok. That's a system that is actually now in production in the Bing search engine. It has a very similar motivation, uh, very similar policies in principle. However, unlike our system, which is based on runtime enforcement, this is strictly doing static analysis. Okay? And therefore, one of the limitations in that work is, and the authors are we're in contact with them, right? they're quite open about this, is that you can essentially do t you know, data type-based policies. You cannot refer to individual data items. Just don't have enough context. Uh, on the other hand, they have zero runtime overhead, which is great. And I think we're now moving in the direction of using some static analysis to try to reduce our overheads, and it turns out they are moving into introducing some runtime enforcement to try to have more, have richer policies. So maybe we'll meet in the middle. I'll skip the others, but they're, they're pretty obvious, right? There's a lot of work on information flow control. I tried to point out what the differences are, uh, and obviously there's a lot of uh, work on declarative policies and enforcement in operating systems and other type of systems. Let me conclude at this point. So <clears throat> we're, we're working on providing uh, a runtime enforcement for data compliance in the form of a layer that's integrated into the operating systems kernel um, of, uh, of, of a data center computation. Um, we have a, a, a policy language that allows expression of fairly rich policies, pretty much all policies that we're aware of that arise in this context. Um, and these policies are you know, simple to read, they're, they're short. Um, and they're attached to conduits, so it's very easy to audit, you know, what policy is in place, and you know that it is in place as long as um, uh, your, your operating system storage and your thought implementation uh, is, is correct. Um, it's aimed currently at compliance and data retrieval systems because that data flow that I explained to you earlier is uh, suitable for the type of enforcement, in particular the type of declassification that we're currently doing. But in ongoing work, we're trying to actually extend this to uh, general SQL databases. This would allow us to do things, for instance, like saying a particular column in the database is private, but it can be used for selection in selection queries, right? This is something we can't currently do because we don't have the context 
for what a particular database cell is used for, whether it's used for just selection or actually for extrication. Um, and we think we can do that without bringing you know, the entire database into the trusted computing base. Um, I mentioned we're, we're uh, moving in the direction of doing some static analysis, for instance, on these SQL queries. That'll simplify the runtime enforcement. Um, and longer term, we're interested in extending this also to more general data processing systems, where you're really extricating the results of some complex computation. But there, of course, you need to have um, statistical operators that allow you to express declassification policies that do things like differential privacy. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd love to get your, um, your questions and comments.